I'm going to cut to the quick and tell you what I know, and then I will further elucidate on this topic throughout the entire broadcast, weaving it in with other subjects. But this is the focus of today's broadcast, and you can guess what it is. With regards to the photograph, my understanding is that metadata has been extracted from the photograph to show that there is a reference to document ancestors which suggests that a copy and paste function was used as part of the image making process and that multiple images were merged. Analysis further suggests that the photograph was taken on this Friday past. The image was first saved at 9.54 p.m. on Friday night and secondly at 9.39 on Saturday morning. The image was saved in the photo editing software Adobe Photoshop twice on an Apple Mac. It was taken at Adelaide Cottage on a Canon 5D Mark IV with a Canon 50mm lens. Isn't it scary what metadata can show from a photograph? Well, that's what it tells us. The software, the lens, even down to the location of Adelaide Cottage. I can also tell you that there is no sinister work at play. There is no darkly mysterious motives. What there was is a reorganisation of several images into one. What there was were four different faces plucked at their best from various photographs and brought together to bring the best shots into one shot which is rather standard these days, rather normal, and it's not hugely disingenuous. Secondly, what must be noted for the day is that the Princess of Wales was photographed, leaving Windsor with Prince William as he travelled to Westminster Abbey for the Commonwealth Day service. She was en route to a private appointment. No doubt the fact that it was private will not suffice for the rest of the world. This comes in the wake of Catherine taking the extraordinary step of issuing a public apology for personally editing a photograph. Now, I had argued some days ago, if you might recall, that no update was required. I was sick to death of people asking for updates all over the press and beyond and even in the comment section. This is a woman in convalescence, and I think today of all days, seems to be a time when the world at large are forgetting this fact. A world forgetting that this is a woman, a doer of good deeds in convalescence and recovery, of staunch character. However, when an update, if you want to call it an update, did appear, and the world seemed enthused, then Perhaps a part of me did question my discernment for a moment. I thought, well, no harm done. She's provided a photograph. Everyone knows she's alive. You know, any fruit loops out there? Well, I no longer question my discernment. I no longer question it. And it proves to me why. It's a tough message. Never complain, never explain. It's almost impossible to stick to. Sounds easy. One of the hardest things to do. It is my opinion the Princess of Wales has made a mistake. Not so much with the photographic imagery being clumsy, although that was rather careless, but the mistake was the apology. Gracious? Yes, it was. Sweet for most of us? Yes, it was. But royal? No. Absolutely not from a future queen. And I'm sorry, but any healthy, well-adjusted adult out there would not give the evident editing of the photograph, the minor adjustments we've seen made, they wouldn't give it two seconds thought. They wouldn't give it two seconds thought. They wouldn't dwell on such matters. Any healthy-minded, well-adjusted adult, any of my friends, I'm sorry, my dear, if, the, you know, if it doesn't apply to you, but most of us have got better things to do than dwell on conspiracy theories. Anyway, she has, she has addressed the so-called concerns of hoi polloi 
And although her humility and an apology can show strength, I'm not saying that an apology and uh, humility cannot be very desirable features of a human nature. They are. But in this instance, I felt weakness to appease a baying mob. And I have every sympathy for the Princess of Wales. You know that I adore the gal. This is not a reprimand. It's a warning shot. We will continue to focus on this matter throughout the broadcast. I give you fair warning. It was Oscar Wilde, if you recall, who said there is only one thing in the world worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. The picture of Dorian Gray, and we can juxtapose this with the picture of Catherine Wales. Drama, speculation, mystery, conspiracy theory, all the ingredients, my dear, all nonsense on stilts, and all undesirable, but, but, with optimism, the attention, the chatter, is blood for veins, my dear. It is blood for veins. So it's nothing for us to get Arnica's in a twist about, I believe. Because if the absence of Catherine and the King at this current time heightens interest, for example, in the Commonwealth Day service of today and the royal family in general, it's lemonade from lemons. Do bear that in mind, my dear. It's lemonade from lemons. Not lemonada. The Queen and the Prince of Wales led activities representing His Majesty the King today, but we were treated to a message from our Sovereign himself, which was filmed last month and played the service today. There were themes of friendship, Commonwealth family. We recognise today, said the King, that our diversity is our greatest strength. And usually I would buckle at this. Oh, gosh, not again, not, not again. No, no, please don't feed us this baloney. I've had quite enough. Word soup. Well, if he's talking about our nation, then I would object because diversity is our absolute weakness, I'm afraid, my dear. Uh, we were a strong nation way before diversity came along and reared its uh, politically correct head. No, that's done nothing for the fabric of this nation. It is dismantling it. At this very moment, it is dismantling it. More about that later. And the Reform Party. But when it comes to the subject of the Commonwealth, that is a horse of a different colour. And that is where diversity is a strength and where it does help bind and bring understanding and foster interesting relationships and the sharing of knowledge and information. So I support that. And I noticed, as an aside, that the King pronounces words like Kenya, as I do, not Kenya, as others do, including those who, whose families colonised those shores, but Kenya, and also circumstances do you notice the unusual way I pronounce that word? And I'm not trying to be, what's the word? Beginning with P. I'm not trying to be prescriptive about the way you pronounce things. I pronounce things any way I like all the time and I change and mix up the pronunciation. I have various um, influences from both sides of my family and beyond. So I don't care at all. I'm just saying out of interest for those of you that enjoy talking about words that the King also says circumstances. And I did mention this many months ago, but I was told and directed to pronounce the word circumstance instead of circumstance or circumstance. I think originally I would say circumstance, circumstance. But uh, I was told in no uncertain terms by a very strict friend, the late actor Jeremy Young, who was once married to the late Kate Amar of Dynasty fame. Uh, he told me, whatever anybody tells you, wherever you go in life, never pronounce circumstance any other way than the way that I've just told you. Circumstance. And I never have. Since that moment, I just believed him so very much. And since then, I've noticed all kind of people with good taste. You know, using, using the same, using the same, like the king. Yes. <laughs> The usual gang of neon yellow protesters were in attendance. Oh, what a fun day out must be for them. What a fun old party. Losers. It sullied the scene, but 
we have to remember that isn't it wonderful we live in a so-called free country where they have the right to protest against a monarchy they have every right to be there but do take your yellow vulgar neons somewhere out of sight instead of sullying our royal scenes you blighters ginger spice was also in the house old jerry horner sitting in the corner she arrived in innocent white have you noticed that's the wardrobe in the face of all allegations against dear Christian Horner. Naughty boy in the corner. Well, she's showing her innocence by wearing white. <laughs> like a religious uh, madra figure. Innocent in white netting she was. And Baroness Scotland, always gorgeous, isn't she? Something about Baroness Scotland. You know, she's a Labour gal, but I wouldn't mind sitting down and cozying up and getting, sipping the tea with her. She was dignified, a dignified confection in subtle muted tones. And Prince William greeted his stepmother, Queen Camilla. Uh, cue thunder and lightning. Ah, the evil Queen Camilla. Uh, yeah. He greeted her with a kiss, kisses to both cheeks, not the buttocks, but at the face, a kiss to either side. And Uncle Edward also received a royal peck to both cheeks, again, not his buttock cheeks in greeting and uh, the princess royal oh she was stunning today she was stunning did you see she was wearing that shibumi grace coat in venetian red exquisite or exquisite as they would say during an oscar wilde performance very regal light blue hat she paired it with and she really looked like she was having fun and enjoying herself she loves that role you know she loves that role and i think especially in the last few years, she realises how appreciated and loved and admired she really is. It's true. And a lot of that has to do with the likes of these kind of platforms, my kind of videos, and social media in general that have latched on to the lesser celebrated members of the royal family. Speaking of which, the Edinburghs were a delight. Uh, chic. Sophie was chic. And they were all treated to great performances throughout the entire affair. So wonderful dancing, celebrations. Oh, and the Queen's hat, the Queen's hat, and the Queen's brooch. What a whopper, what a whopper. Big Willie's got a rival in the house and it's a blue brooch. Was it aquamarine, aquamarine or some sort of topaz? I couldn't find out what it was, my dear. You might be able to tell me, but uh, word is it's a new jolly. Well, it is, it's a new jolly, but a great big whopping heart in a sort of Care Bear pastel blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me a give me, give me, give me a man after midnight and a brooch at church. That's what I want, my dear. Luscious, a luscious aquamarine and a yellow and green posy to clutch and sniff. Gorgeous. And the glosses were there too. Immaculate. It almost looked like uh, the Duchess had a fur trim, if you'll excuse the expression, my dear. I don't mean anything untoward, but it looked like it had some sort of furry trim or a velvet trim or some sort of velour. The mind boggles. And by the way, speaking about clothes and colours, I can see in the screen here that this isn't going to read the colour it actually is. It's a corally tangerine, quite light, but it's reading brighter. And I expect once it's colour graded, it'll read red. It's not red or orange. It's a sort of corally pinky affair. Wasted, wasted. You see, this is what can happen. This is what can happen. And in the mix I'm talking about when it comes to photoshopping and imagery and colour grading and the difference between what you see in real life and what is presented to you. A picture paints a thousand words. What is it they say? Or oh, the camera never li never lies? Oh, I can't be bothered to work out what I mean. I've got no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> As you might have guessed. I've got to wing it, my dear. It's very late here in the evening. Very late here, scrambling all this together. I want to also drop in and say that I have been corrected by some viewers. And rightly so. You are on it. You are on it. This was on the subject of mum in the UK, M-U-M, or mummy, and mom in the US, however you pronounce it there, M-O-M, mom, how we would have to say it here in England. 
and Canadians also told me that they spell it mom but they pronounce it mum like us so there's all different kinds of varieties but I have had a gentle slap on the wrist from a few West Midlanders here such as Claire Hale who was one of a few who said River have you ever graced the West Midlands with your presence maybe it's a brummy thing but we all say mom mom if you're abroad, Brummy, and the Brummy accent, by the way, is a sort of abbreviation of Birmingham, the area of Birmingham in the West Midlands. Think of Ozzy Osbourne, he originates, and his accent, his original accent, was a Brummy accent. He would have said Mom, I suppose, Mom, in some sort of way. So I have been put right there. I was also put right by the good people of Wales who say Mam, which is wonderful. That might be my favourite, actually, Mam. Uh, so it all goes, it all goes, but we don't all say mum or mummy here in the kingdom. There are, of course, 6,000 million regional accents and I adore every single one of them. Maybe, perhaps, except for a couple, but most of them. And yes, I even love, what's the one that everyone hates? Geordie. I love Geordie. I love the Geordie accent too. Adore it. There's actually a couple from Ireland that I'm not keen on. There are many that I adore. Calm down, my dear Irish roots. There are many that I absolutely adore and are exquisite, but a few of them. No. Uh, have I graced the West Midlands with my presence? Well, I've been there a number of times, but I'm not intimately acquainted with the West Midlands. To my chagrin, I hope to be in the future. I know the Hippodrome very well, and I've got one old pal that lives there. Uh, she used to tell me, I don't know if it's still there, but she would tell me about the Bourneville Museum and invite me to go and go there with her, and I will one day. But let's return to our Katrina, the Princess of Wales. Katrina, Katrina Devine. Like many amateur photographers, she said in her apology, I do occasionally experiment with editing. I wanted to express my apologies for any confusion the family photograph we shared yesterday caused. I hope everyone celebrating had a very happy Mother's Day. C. And on the subject of Mother's Day, for those of you that inquired, uh, yes, my family did enjoy the takeaway that I brought to them. I treated them to a Thai takeaway, didn't I, my dears? And I was disappointed they went for the prawn and pineapple fried rice. All of them did. They loved it. And I've got to tell you, there's nothing more gratifying than either cooking for your loved ones and feeling the appreciation if it goes well, or even delivering a gorgeous, delicious takeaway for them. They couldn't have been more grateful. <laughs> it was the best present ever uh, that I wasn't able to indulge in, sadly, because of my eating regime temporarily, which was hard going, but they really enjoyed it. Su a succulent feast it was, and I gifted mummy some gourmet licorice which she also thought was absolutely heavenly. This apology from Catherine came after at least five picture agencies recalled the image of her and the children over concerns that it had been digitally altered. Oh, clutch the pearls, clutch the pearls. Never seen a digitally altered or enhanced photograph before, have you, my darlings? Reuters withdrew because it did not meet Reuters standards of image quality and the other ones were Getty, the Associated Press, Agence France Press, and Shutterstock. They all killed the image, they call it. They killed it. So dramatic, isn't it? And apparently that was followed by the PA, which I presume is the Press Association. Now, you can skip ahead a couple of minutes if you want, but I am going to run through 16 of the known Photoshop issues for those of you who have not been following this story closely as silly as the entire thing is. Let's do a deep dive. Number one, Charlotte's hand. Empty space where sleeves should be. Number two, Catherine's zip top is further left than it should be. Number three, Charlotte's hair ends abruptly on the right shoulder. At number four, Charlotte's shirt, or should I say Charlotte's web, the sequel, a web of mystery, a Charlotte's skirt, the corners appear unusually straight. Charlotte's knee, 
At number five, her right knee appears washed out on one edge. Dicey, dicey. And now we come to little innocent Louis. His jumper pattern appears disrupted on the right arm at number six. At number seven, it's Louis again on his right hand side. There is a blurred right thumb against his trouser. Ooh, er, misses. And at number eight, there's a wonky ledge at the top edge of a stone which appears distorted. Oh, some people have got a lot of time on their hands, haven't they? Number nine offers a wonky ledge at the bottom edge of a stone which appears distorted. And the wonkiness continues at number 10. A wonky step, the edge of a step against a wall is disrupted. At number 11, Louis's left hand, little finger seems to end early. And at 12, George's right arm, edge of jumper looks artificial. At 13, Catherine's right hand, there is a blurred hand, but the jumper is unblurred. So that is a mystery, that is a quiz. And at 14, Catherine's hair. The famous locks are blurred on the right, but the jumper is unblurred. The plot thickens. At 15, Charlotte's hair. Right of hair dips in unnaturally, unnaturally. And finally, at 16, George's sleeve. Odd lines appearing on the jumper. This is a quiz for the mind of an Agatha Christie, a Miss Marple, Hercule Poirot, or Inspector Gadget, I do not know. But if Lieutenant Colombo is too busy to solve this case, my intuition, and I'm being serious now, my dear, my intuition is, well, at least I think we can safely say that it's not vanity at play. You know, it's not vanity at play because that seems to always be at the back of some sort of suggestions and rumours. Uh, not vanity because there's no real suggestion that the faces have been tweaked beyond all sort of recognition. And let's face it, my dear, as attractive as Catherine and the kids look in this photograph, you know, Catherine looks very pretty in it. We've all seen selfies. We've all seen selfies, but uh, sorry, crowd photographs taken with Catherine with no, no filters at all, no possible type of interference. And I'm talking by the tens of thousands. They allow anybody to take their photograph. If she had something to hide about her face that was so hideous that she wanted to disguise, then she would be swiftly disabused of that ability, wouldn't she? We all know exactly what she looks like and she looks divine. Even a bad photograph of Catherine is good. There was one during the Poppy Day celebrations, wasn't there, that kept doing the rounds. People said she looked rather old and haggard. She was in black. I, I can tell you, my bad photos that I wouldn't want anyone to see look about 6,000 times worse and more haggard than that, my dear. So I certainly we wouldn't want to complain about it. I don't know about you. Um, I certainly don't get away with looking good on the iPhones and the HD cameras of today. I look like shit in about 99 out of 100 photographs. I must say I don't filter anything. I don't use filter. I, would, I don't know how to. My, I'm not on Instagram or anything like that. I've never face tuned anything in my life. I'm not saying I'm opposed to it. I don't do any, any of that. But I do clean up sometimes uh, the odd thumbnail. And I have to say quite rarely there's nothing really to change. It's just me as you see me now. But occasionally there will be uh, in photographs a scuff or a mark or a weird angle or I can't think a shadow that I might clean up or tweak. But to be honest, I haven't really got anything horrific about me to tweak. And nor have Catherine and the children. So I don't see how these rumours have come to pass. There might have been a graze on Charlotte's hand. But what I believe is that simply she took separate images, you know, decided on the best image of each of them and grouped them together in one photograph. This is what happened. This is what seems obvious to me that happened from the little lines, the sort of rather amatory looking lines that appear on some of the photographs and multiple images being used as we've learned from the metadata. It seems that she's, you know, perhaps Charlotte uh, wasn't giving the best expression on one photograph. So she lopped the head off of one photograph and put it on that one. 
and tried to blend the two together in a sort of muddle-handed way. Do you understand, my dear? This is all that's happened. This is all that's happened. This sort of tidying up, cleaning up to present a photograph is a common practice, as any amateur enthusiast or semi-pro or pros will tell you and would do. So, you know, don't give up the day job yet, Catherine, if you want to be a photographic editor, because it doesn't seem that she really works at that with any kind of aplomb, but stick to photography. She's a good photographer, as is William, apparently. They capture wonderful expressions. But in actual fact, we should be encouraged, if anything, by this homemade affair, at no cost to the taxpayer, for example. We should be rather enthused by the fact that Catherine takes an interest to her artistic skills and her hobby in photography and spices things together, as hundreds of thousands upon millions do. Everybody does the same these days, my dear. And uh, now, you see, again on the subject of don't explain, don't explain. Why? Because in the face of offering this apology now, you know, it's not going to kill it, it's not going to shut it down. Now they're asking Kensington Palace to release the original. They want to see the original, to see the difference between Catherine's editing and the original. <laughs> you cannot win, you're going, not going to appease commoners in the hoi polloi. Explaining is not going to help, you know, the madding crowd. And I know this from my small experience. There's times when I've tried explaining certain things to audience. There's times when I've tried to explain certain behaviours and actions that I've had to take. That I've had to take. And I found that people will simply not, and in some circumstances, cannot hear you. They cannot hear you. They're too far forward in their own story that they have created about you, or one, or me, or the incident at hand. They're too far forward, they don't hear you. They can't wrap their ears around what you're explaining, and it only leads to further questioning. It doesn't suffice, it never suffices for them. You give them an inch, you think, you know, I want to show generosity here and give an inch. They want a mile. This is nine times out of ten or more. I know from experience, and it is actually dreadful and very hurtful and violating for those of us on the receiving end of this. You know, if any, if this applies to any of the you, you'll know this. To those of us who might expect a bit of compassion or a civil solution, it is not always possible. Nine times out of ten, it's not. Because the blind cannot see, metaphorically speaking. The blind cannot see. One wants to be generous of spirit, one tries and attempts to be, and not miserly of spirit, but one gets one's fingers burnt, and it is very hurtful and damaging in a way that they don't comprehend. And this is what Catherine is going to be up against if she continues trying to explain. No further explanation has been offered so far, although royal sources have told the media that there were just minor adjustments made, which seems the most obvious answer. There are many drama queens in the press coming forward today, giving uh, little vox pops and sound bites uh, over what, and clutching their pearls over what a huge PR mistake this is. It's a nightmare, it's a nightmare. Some of them cry, these experts. Uh, try as they might, I would urge those of you who admire Catherine as I do, to have faith that Catherine will return and, as I said a week or two ago, will be more adored, more worshipped than ever before. Yes, that is what you're going to see, my dear. I'm afraid that whatever they do, however they try, those who might have nefarious intentions, nothing shores up a robust defence like an attack. Do you understand? Nothing shores it up like especially an unfair attack. Passions are aroused in those instances. Deep-seated loyalties unleashed. Devout love says, River, respectfully, fake photos don't support the theory that Kate is all right. Rather, it perpetuates more suspicion about her well-being. Really, in capital letters, what's up with the fake photographs? So a salty little comment there, but one that I appreciate and one that I will sh respond to in fairness, and I'll tell you why. 
I'll tell you why. I read this out because these are especially valid points that devout love is making if, not addressed to me, but if you happen to be one of those people who call out Harry and Meghan for similar activities, or should I say for excessive photoshopping conspiracies. I'm afraid there are going to be a few hypocrites out there if you're going to take umbrage over Catherine's treatment but dish out the same to Harry and Meghan. And I'm not saying that I'm not a harsh critic of them because I am, but I also consider myself to be a fair critic. And I'm not talking about criticism about their excessive vanity retouching, for example, such as the time cover, because that was just comical, wasn't it? And preposterous, and it ended up looking absolutely nothing like them, especially Harry, who looked like some sort of handsome, wonderful, uh, hunky hero. Uh, after their retouching, you know, like different people. That's what I call excessive vanity uh, retouching and photoshopping. But I know what I'm talking about here is people who talk about, you know, they're into the conspiracy the theories, Archie's ever changing hair colour, for example. I mean, is it going from black to ginger to this, that and the fourth. Any official photograph or image of Archie might have a subtle difference in his, his, hair, his hair shade. And you might see subtle differences in my hair shade due to the colour grading or where the light's falling or if there's daylight coming through the window or if I'm recording at night, but usually the colour grading. This throne, this chair behind me will look a different shade of purple in every video. Sometimes it looks black, sometimes it looks a brighter purple, depending on the colour grading that I've had to use afterwards to adjust the brightness uh, to to try and give you the clearest, best view of things and the lighting. The white balance, what they call the white balance of an image. Things like this change, but people jump and pounce on these types of things. Lilibet's finger, I remember from one Christmas thing, they cobbled together, weirdly located limbs. And I don't expect you to remember my broadcasts on those subjects from many months ago, but I did get disparaged from some of you who said that I just couldn't face up to the fact that, you know, this had been rearranged, this had been twisted. I could face up to the fact, but I wasn't going to ever criticise them. And I didn't criticise them for all those types of uh, photoshopping errors because it's standard. It's standard these days. Everyone does a little bit of it. And I'm so glad that I didn't criticise them for those particular things. Because otherwise I wouldn't be able to sit here today and defend Catherine for it. Would I? I wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, and I wouldn't be able to whinge about people uh, coming out with such nitpicking over a photograph. Well, I can because I didn't get that nitpicky over Harry and Meghan's uh, photoshopping adventures, which was probably down to their production teams. Who knows if it was actually them? They didn't come forward and confess to anything, did they? So I just mentioned that for what it's worth because I've never disparaged or joined in with that sort of witch hunt mentality in those regards. But if anybody did object to those sort of things at the time, then they can't complain when others object to what's happened this week. And that's why I do read out your comment, devout love, and give it a fair airing. What's up with the fake photos, you say? I'm glad that I always kept my counsel and the thing that I object to is the inane stupidity on both ends of the lollipop. The Waleses and the Harkles. But truly, the bottom line regarding the furore we see this week is that the headlines, as the press have discovered, are fabulously clickable. All these headlines and 16 different points of interest of what's gone wrong on the photograph, they are so clickable for the millions out there and for the public at large. It's lucrative. That is the bottom line. It's lucrative and it's making the press a lot of money to have all this silly attention. You have the likes of Liz Jones, who actually have rather enjoyed her column over the years in New Magazine and, you know, with brushed shoulders, as I've mentioned before. Um, she can, she's a talented writer. She is a really talented writer because she gets attention. She gets bums on seats and she can intrigue with her dramatizations. But this was a dramatization today, some hysterical piece in the mail because, you know, she's always writing very high praise articles about Catherine. She loves Catherine, this, that, and the fourth. 
But then she was telling us today, and she started going on like one of those characters that I personally can't bear, that are so worried about Catherine, can't sleep at night about Catherine, waiting, uh, clinging for an update, you know, all this parasocial, uh, nincompoopish, boorish stuff. Uh, she's been worried sick and she's gone on to say that it's dreadful PR, could never trust the palace again and that it's an own goal, you know, I mean all this is just the clickable stuff, it's just for sales my dear, bums on seats. I'm not worried at all about Catherine's reputation, I regret actually that she did explain, that's just my personal preference, I don't think it'll be long-term damaging, although I do think it temporarily weakens her position. Catherine is adored, our future Queen is adored and the matter will soon be forgotten. It will be tabloid fodder. It just seems like it's all on heat at the moment. It's a lesson. It's a lesson for Catherine, who we always talk about in flawless terms, never really putting a foot wrong. The time she did put a foot wrong for me was when she was photographed topless. And I don't care if you think it's unfair that I place the blame on her, but I do. She went out onto a balcony with her tits out, and I don't care. She had seen enough of the world to know and the press to know about long lenses to know that there really is not such a thing as uh, privacy when you are shaking your pom-poms on a balcony, my dear. There was no real excuse for it, it was stupidity. That was the first mistake she made. Some might say that the Jamaica tour and the imagery they allowed to be captured there with the, you know, at the bars with all the black people, you know, clutching to get to them behind the bars. I mean, I put that, I don't really put that down to a mistake, although it was, it was down to Catherine's, I would say naivety, but really I just mean her, her goodwill and good personality. There was nothing bad going on. Uh, and if you know the full story about that incident, you know that it was a perfectly natural thing that happened and it was actually a moment of love between Catherine and the people that were there in Jamaica or whichever island they were on at the time as part of that tour. You know that there was nothing in it but Catherine by that time you know and William let's not forget William here you know it might have dawned upon them that rushing up to a fence in that way might give other people a chance to weaponize this is what it's about the trouble is you know like the late Queen Catherine and William would be want to, especially Catherine, would be want to see the good in people and not hedge their bets with too much caution, thinking bad of people, because they're good people. They're good people. But they've got, you know, they've got their work cut out being good by not allowing themselves to be gullible. And then, uh, then we have this this calamity this week, this is, the, this is the next big lesson. Owen R says, the hysteria over the photograph needs to stop. Catherine's apologised for shoddy editing, which I've got to tell you, I didn't notice. I didn't notice when I saw the photograph come up. I've just got better things to do, what can I tell you, my dear, than go looking for every little nook and cranny in the photograph. I thought it was a nice image, but... But yes, she's apologised for shoddy editing. She admits she's an amateur photographer. I would say she's slightly embarrassed by all of this. I should think she is, poor gal. Would the British taxpayer have preferred it if a professional photographer was employed to take the photograph on their dime? I'm sure she'll learn from this and pay close attention to small details in her photography from now on. Let's hope so, Owen R. Because... As sweet as she is, it was rather careless. These are the kind of things I'm afraid she's got to know better about. It's not her fault, it's the nasty world out there that are waiting for all these conspiracy theories and silliness and schnott and trauma and drama. One other individual who was calling for her to be left alone was Lee Anderson, who said, just leave her alone today as part of a press conference, and it was a highly publicised press conference in the moment that I wanted to pay a few moments lip service to because it's of interest to me personally. It's actually a big story here in the Kingdom because Lee Anderson, a cons traditionally conservative MP, has defected to the Reform Party. The Reform Party were born out of UKIP and then more recently and more precisely the Brexit Party, 
which used to be headed by Nigel Farage. He is the person largely connected with that party, although it is headed by or led by Richard Tice at this moment in time. Some say Mr Farage might return to bring it to even higher successes, but at the moment it's Richard Tice. For those abroad, or for those who don't know about what's going on here politically, we have a general election coming up towards the end of the year, isn't it? Not too far away. And uh, we have a Conservative government, we have Labour in opposition who are widely tipped to win after 13 years of Conservative rule. And traditionally the third party, if you like, are the Lib Dems, the Liberal Democrats, but they have been thrashed recently by the Reform Party who have been rising, 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 they've been surging in popularity this year, week after week, getting better and better. They are unpolitically correct, let's put it that way. They are traditionally conservative with a small c, with a small c. Uh, unlike the Conservative Party of today, who are more like a Labour light alternative. And barely even light. It's like having two Labour parties at the moment. Um, they are into, as I say, non-PC activities, conservatism and they stand against immigration, mass immigration, and to be honest, they speak for the vast majority of the country at this point. In a few years, maybe not, but as it stands now, they speak for the common men and women of this land, including me, and including those of the Red Wall, what is known as the Red Wall, the northern seats, which are traditionally Labour, Red Labour, as opposed to Blue Conservative. And... Uh, the Red Wall was charmed by Boris Johnson, you see, when he became Prime Minister, was it in 2019? He wooed the northern part of the country, for example, traditional Labour voters, and uh, won with a huge, stonking, historical majority that nobody thought would ever be possible, and he completely wasted it. The pandemic got in the way. He was not made for the seriousness of a sort of wartime leader, if you will, and it felt like war during the COVID experience, didn't it? Uh, he was really made to be more of a prime minister for the good times, but he found himself there in an inopportune moment and didn't have the gravitas or I think the wherewithal to get us through, to, sheer, to steer the ship and also to take us out. Uh, he was our last hope to take us out of all this pol political correct woke nonsense, you know, down the woke road, all of that. It was a sort of last hope that many of these red wallers had and everybody that voted for him, which was a great deal of the country, had. He threw it away, wasted it, and so have consecutive uh, successive prime ministers. Thrown away, thrown away, disregarded, including uh, Mr Sunak at the moment. Thrown away the opportunity, not listening, not listening, and panicking and clutching pearls about appeasing the uh, very vocal minorities. So that's where we are. Reform or reform, this this new uh, usurper has recruited Lee Anderson, who was a, a Conservative MP. He was also a, a former vice chairman of the Conservative Party. They suspended him last month. They suspended Lee Anderson over his refusal to apologise for his claims that Islamists had got control of a sadistic, that's my word, sadistic Khan. No, uh, control of uh, Sadiq Khan and London, and whether or not you agree with that, I mean, it was rhetoric, and as uh, and as Lee Anderson says himself, he's not a man of great big four-syllable words all the time. He says he knows a few one-syllable words, but, you know. He's, but this is really a free speech issue. You know, he was suspended. Did he lose the whip or something? I can't remember. He was suspended for saying this. You know, there was a time when the government didn't tell us all what to say or do on the sort of level we see these days. And over 13 years, it's become normal for us all to be instructed and dictated to, but dictated to by the government that we vote for, that we put there to work on our behalf, to do what we require them to do with the manifestos they promise. We don't put them there to dictate to us and tell us what to do. That's the position we find ourselves in. And unfortunately, that is what the little ones uh, are growing up, witnessing 
and thinking has always been. They don't understand the freedom of a few years ago or a few decades ago or back into the last century. Real freedom, you know, smoking in public, for example. <laughs> yes, I always come back to that one. But just because it's indicative of a lack of freedom, you can either sense or you can't, I suppose, my dear. But it's very sad to me. And I watched the reveal because it was streamed on YouTube. I watched it there. I watched the reform reveal of Lee Anderson, who was defected to the reform party. And he came across, I don't know much about him. I've never really heard him before, to be honest. But he came across as very authentic. I thought quite powerfully. He's no-nonsense, a no-nonsense northerner. And he was appealing to the Red Wall. It's almost as if he's going to be an, an ambassador for the Reform Party to woo the Red Wall in the North to represent. And uh, as for myself, I am not tied to one political party. I don't consider myself right or left wing. I consider myself a centrist, but with a small C conservatism to my nature, absolutely. Labour is not do not adhere to my... It's a different philosophy, let's put it that way, my dear. Those who admire or vote Labour policies, I have every respect for as much as one can, but they've just gone down a different road to me and see the world from a different angle. And I have no quibble with that. Uh, many, many, many of my loved ones would vote Labour and be on that side of the lollipop. It's just not me. So that's out of the question. Voting for the Conservative Party is entirely out of the question for me this time round. Entirely out of the question for me. They are a disgrace. They are a disgrace. How dare they waste their majority? On principle, no. I refuse to reward them. After 13 years and we've just spiralled down, down, down and invited the whole world here and their mothers on canoe ships and set them up in five-star hotels throughout the land. I'm sorry, my dear, no. Absolutely not. The virtue signalling, unbelievable. The makeup of this country, bringing in undesirables from all over the world, and I'm not talking about genuine uh, asylum seekers, for example, or those who are from nations which have something to truly contribute and not clash with ours and our traditional cultures and the traditional religion of this culture. Uh, bringing them in, not just in, in the scores, in the hundreds, but in the hundreds of thousands every year. What are you doing? It's reckless. It is absolutely reckless in seeing our culture dismantling. No, my dear. So I'm, I'm going to spend time researching the other parties. I don't like really voting for the more minor parties because sometimes it feels like a wasted vote, but I will be researching others. But at this moment, there is every likelihood that I will vote reform. Every likelihood. I'm not confirming one way or the other because I've no, no idea how the cookie's going to crumble by the time the election comes round. But I'm just sharing with you that I'm very impressed with the attitude, even if I haven't truly inspected all their policies so far. Nobody else is speaking to me as they are speaking to me. Nobody else is saying what they need, what they are saying to me. And they're saying it fearlessly, without fear of being termed a racist or a bigot. They don't care at this moment in time, despite all the death threats and the disgraceful uh, protests coming through that I'm sure they might be experiencing. Uh, they speak about I issues that matter to me, and I know many of you as well. Cultural identity, for example, which is vanishing at an astonishing rate here. No pride in our nation. How can there be pride in a nation if it's not one that you've really inherited or come to with any genuine appreciation for gender identity, all this nonsense on stilts about there being anything more than two sexes. Ridiculous. Let's not tolerate that. Uh, mass and illegal immigration. Shocking. Freedom of speech. They are not afraid and they're not trembling to address these issues. The Conservatives tremble. The Labour, that's a different matter altogether. But I'm hoping this is a tipping point. I want a real alternative to Labour and Labour light, the Conservatives. And don't get me wrong, I would never tell you how to vote. I'm not the most ginned up person on politics at all. I'm the last person in the world to claim to be educated to any great extent on that. But I would say that I must encourage you, especially if you are watching from the Kingdom, I would encourage your engagement 
and I would encourage you to take a look at reform and uh, I, I wanted to share my enthusiasm for them because I want to do my part in bringing to public attention a party that are saying what I want to hear like any political party do I know if they'll deliver do I know if they'll be able to deliver no I do not but the Conservatives haven't and I don't want what Keir Starmer is going to deliver um, but the people will have their say and if they vote in Mr Starmer so be it we'll see what he comes up with won't we but I certainly will not be rewarding the Conservatives with a vote just to keep Mr Starmer out Elizabeth emblem oh no this is not a, a, a comment from elizabeth emblem i'm about to speak to you about the elizabeth emblem <laughs> sorry that just tickled me we're going to end on a nice note regarding the elizabeth emblem because it's been created to commemorate public servants who died in the line of duty and it's to be conferred by the king on families who are bereaved and grieving for police officers firefighters emergency workers and public servants it's the equivalent of the Elizabeth Cross, which is the one that recognises members of the armed forces who died in action. And the concept was agreed by Queen Elizabeth in 2020 and signed off by the King this year. The design incorporates a rosemary wreath, which is a traditional symbol of remembrance surrounding the Tudor crown. It's inscribed for a life given in service with their name on the reverse and a pin so that their next of kin can wear the adornment. Thanks for your company, my old fruits. I look forward to seeing you in the next broadcast. Doodle Pip. <laughs>